This morning we want to discuss a problem that is close to the lives of most of us in one way or another, and yet which contributes considerable conflict unless we think it through and feel it through and arrive at certain reasonable basic conclusions. Now sometimes we wonder whether or not what we learn or what we hear can really make a basic change in ourselves or solve problems which are rooted within our own natures. We often feel that important and enduring changes must come from within our own consciousness and cannot result merely from the impact of external evidence, even though we may accept that evidence as true. Actually, we do have to change from within ourselves. But it is quite possible, as history and case history demonstrate, for the individual to change from within himself as a result of the improvement of his knowledge. In other words, the attitude which we hold toward life is our own, but it is conditioned by a growing intelligence, by an unfolding understanding of how we can improve our own conduct. And as we understand more about ourselves, we do find strength and courage to make necessary and useful adjustments. Within each of us, is a strongly polarized energy, an energy which may basically manifests through mental and emotional activities. These in turn react upon the physical body and cause its various adjustments and adaptations to both the inner life and the environment in which we live. We know also that emotions and thoughts are not necessarily reconciled or synchronized. And we have all experienced a waste of emotional and mental energy. We also realize that we waste much more energy upon problems of internal conflict than upon those duties and responsibilities which we must meet in the world. Thus we exhaust ourselves through internal conflict and through the friction of energy fields to such a degree that very often we no longer have any vitality with which to activate conduct. Now this exhaustion of energy often also leads to an attitude of bewilderment or uncertainty. This in itself prevents clear causes of action. And the, un and the individual who is functioning from an internal bewilderment can seldom keep his external affairs in order. We must, however, not assume that a tyrannical exertion of force by which the mind either completely dominates or the emotions entirely predominate, that either such extreme attitude is useful. The emotional mental balance was created to enrich the inner life of the individual and to make available to him a better balance approach to conduct. If therefore either of these polarities is deficient, conduct is impoverished. Yet it would seem to us that there is no reconciliation of these dynamic polarities. 
and we wonder how we can bring them into harmony and concord within ourselves. I think we may definitely say that uh, the history of civilization reveals that the two great hemispheres of human population, the Eastern and the Western hemispheres, are outstanding examples of such polarizations. We may not be able to trace this polarization in the individual, but in the collective action of peoples, we find a tremendous emphasis upon this polarization. In Western civilization today, there is a strong emphasis upon emotional pressure. And that is one of the reasons why we are dominated by such a strong uh, psychological situation in which the individual has great difficulty in adjusting his own temperament to the world in which he lives. Now, adjustability is one of the basic problems that we face. And the question arises, first, how mental and emotional energy either contribute to this adjustment or detract from it. We have already often pointed out that the stronger of these polarities within the human consciousness is emotional. The emotional nature with its intensities is older, deeper, and usually more dominant than the intellectual nature. The mind of man, as we look back and observe, has only recently come under strong discipline. As we go back into the history of philosophy and religion, we observe that in ancient times, uh, these great arts and sciences were in the keeping of very small minorities. We did have a magnificent philosophic culture in Greece, but this culture was limited to a small group of persons. We also had a much simpler way of life than we know today. And while probably to the Athenian it was as complicated as he could stand, Still, he did not face many of the decisions and problems which daily confront us. The possibility of being able to sustain modern pressure with as much dignity and grace as we now exhibit is a proof of tremendous internal growth. But this internal growth, particularly of the mind, has a comparatively short human history. It is only within the last three or four hundred years, for example, that the average individual has thought of himself as a self-sustaining intellectual entity. Prior to that time, he depended for his mental life upon leadership, upon authority, and upon tradition. While these forces are still active, it is safe to say that the average modern human being now considers intellectual liberty, freedom of thought, as a birthright, and as something uh, with which he may reasonably expect to be endowed. This endowment, however, is a comparatively recent experience for him and his bloodstream and the background of his race does not give him as much support in his mental life as it does on the level of his emotions. Emotional activity has always existed, and emotional activity has always been highly individualized. The feelings of persons have been deep since most savage time, and even the primitive aboriginal person has the same basic affections the same instincts and the same impulses which we know today. Certainly, emotion also has gone through considerable unfoldment and growth. But its history is longer, adjustments were made at a remote time, and the emotional rights of the person 
have seldom, if ever, been seriously questioned. There were centuries in which there was no freedom of thought permitted to man. But even in these days, it was almost impossible to curb his emotions. Because his emotions were not, so under groups and patterns that legislation could be made against them. The emotional life of the person is largely internal, and this can continue even under tyranny. In fact, tyranny becomes a tremendous emotional stimulation, leading uh, to positive and often dramatic reprisals on the part of the emotional instinct in human nature. All of these tell us that man is actually better able to administer emotion than he is thought. And where his emotions have not been viciously mistrained, they nearly always are consistent with the basic psychic constitution of the human being. Emotions, however, are very personal and therefore more difficult to universalize than thoughts. Emotions do not have perspective. They do not have the dimensions of mental potential. Emotions, for the most part, are emerging pressures which are neither questioned nor analyzed. We react to them inevitably. And whereas the mind acts as a censorship over emotion, its uh, powers are very seldom applied against emotional conviction. Now, in daily living, the emotions of the individual are very often so personal so intimate and so continuous in their pressures that the person lives a large emotional life within himself. He is therefore living even in this world in a more or less imaginary sphere. Emotion includes within itself the tremendous power of vitalizing internal imagery. By emotion, for example, we may have a utopian, a person who inwardly feels the possibility of a wonderful world filled with happy people dwelling together in peace. This emotional realization, uh, when dwelt upon, when nurtured, when stimulated within the compound of the human being, leads to the gradual development of an internal life. And this internal life becomes so real, so intensely valuable, and essentially so reasonable that it becomes difficult for us to understand why other persons cannot and do not share our conviction. The more wealth we have of internal emotion, the more we desire to share, to give, and very often enthusiasm causes us to overstep reasonable and proper boundaries. Emotion rising within us like the tide of a great ocean seeks to sweep away all obstacles both internal and external, and to exercise its full expression at all times. Yet this emotion, regardless of its essential nobility or even sublimity, flowing from ourselves, meets not the general acceptance which we emotionally conceive to be inevitable, but actually meets with powerful resistance. And we discover that the dreams that we hold, the hopes that we have, the beauties that we feel, are not shared by others, are not understood, are not appreciated, and are even rejected empirically. Now the reason why this is true 
is probably because other persons also have this powerful emotional core within themselves. An emotion is much more readily available for an outflowing than it is for receiving or taking into itself the emotional reactions of other persons. Our emotions are positive, and because we all have these positive emotions, it is easier to give than to receive, and it is very difficult for an individual's internal emotional life uh, to be easily changed or moved by the emotional convictions of others. Thus, on the level of emotions, we lock, and each person's dreams become so important to him that there is little space or place in his consciousness for the dreams of others. Now, we might wish and hope that all persons would dream alike and dream true, but this is not possible. The reason, of course, is that the emotions do not represent a pure stream of spiritual energy. They represent a highly conditioned reflex to the total integration of the personality itself. Our emotions are therefore inevitably the production of what we are and not the production of what we should be or will be. The person's emotions may be inconsistent with those of others, but they are always consistent with the totality of himself. And as this totality is not yet mature, the individual does not have any regularly integrated emotional relationships with those around him. Emotions are also extremely personal and are exemplified through certain personal contacts and reactions and reflexes, both internal and external. Quickly stimulated, emotions rise with tremendous ardor. And when the stimulation wanes or is removed, they recede with equal rapidity. And this great emotional motion is a kind of tide which ebbs and flows within individuals and is brought into full manifestation through certain stimulations, either within the person or within his environment. It is obvious, therefore, that under a complete despotism of emotion, the individual would have no control over his own conduct. Emotions resist control. They seek to break through at every vulnerable point. And uh, they are, of course, most difficult when they break through into personalities essentially disorganized and without adequate self-discipline. Emotions may sometimes exercise this self-discipline. But emotional discipline is quite different from mental. Emotional discipline arises very largely from an exaltation of the emotions through religion. Thus, religion exercises certain powerful moral disciplines upon the intensities of feelings. And we know, for example, that in the sacred uh, scriptures of our Western world, uh, that uh, works such as the Psalms, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes, uh, the great moral books of the Old Testament, have much to do uh, with the rise of codes for the integration and improvement of the emotional life of the individual. But emotional uh, pressures are subject, therefore, to powerful of spiritual implications, which are called virtues. And these virtues touch us because of long experience with emotional intensities and have taught us that certain things are not good and must not be permitted to function within us. Thus we have strong uh, scriptural, moral, 
and even philosophical disciplines relating to unselfishness, renunciation, uh, compassion, the uh, human affections and their refinement, and also strong emotional attitudes toward the rights of others, and the privileges of other human beings. Actually, however, the pressure of emotion is so great that we are most likely to carry a large part of our moral discipline, not upon an emotional level, but upon a mental level. And we find the mind attempting uh, to correct emotional disturbance or to, in one way or another, circumscribe and keep within boundary emotional excess. On this level, the mind acts uh, through what may be termed the gradual development of an over-concept in man, a concept born from experience and to a degree from reverse and still perhaps more definitely from the observation of the results of emotional excess in the lives of others we gradually come to realize that certain feelings which we have cannot be tolerated and must not. That it becomes necessary to our survival. That we do not react instantly and inevitably to emotional pressure. In the effort, therefore, to develop what we call self-control, we may, to some degree, attempt the moderation of emotional excess. But self-control for most persons is artificial. It is a frustration accompanied by a measure of rebellion. The individual does not instinctively desire to control himself. He desires to express himself on the emotional level. Thus control becomes an inhibition upon him. And if these controls become too strong, even on a religious level, they can result in serious damage to the emotional entity. On the emotional level, controls do not come from reason. They come from theological acceptances or convictions. Thus the individual who realizes that jealousy, for example, is a dangerous emotion and one which can cause him a great deal of trouble, uh, seeks for a strong motive to control jealousy. And in this search for motive, he comes upon religious conviction. He is taught that it is against the will of God for him to be jealous and therefore that jealousy is a sin. And as no individual who has a gradually unfolding moral nature wishes to continuously convict, con, uh, convict himself of a sin, it becomes expedient for him to control jealousy. It also becomes expedient because experience has shown him that jealousy ultimately damages himself. He might, however, lack the courage of his own conviction did he not believe that he lived in a universe ruled over by laws and that these laws themselves were opposed to jealousy and that if he practiced this emotional attitude to excess, he would come into conflict with these laws. Thus emotional control rises from the emotional acceptance of, of a power, a force, or a pattern stronger than the individual, against which he cannot succeed, and before which he must bow and acknowledge allegiance. This emotional force may not be rationalized. Ninety-nine persons out of a hundred who attempt to control their emotional life through their religious convictions have never analyzed these convictions or attempted to determine the integrity of the authority which they accept. 
they accept and in so doing impose certain restrictions upon themselves, these restrictions leading uh, to self-discipline. These restrictions may go much further, however, and may lead to asceticism or to the complete renunciation of worldliness or the attempt to escape the consequences of emotional pressure by remaining aloof from all environmental relationships, trying in this way to escape the stimulation of emotion rather than to direct or control it once it has come into manifestation. If any of these courses are followed to an extreme, we are almost certain to have trouble. For in any event, we find a tremendous energy meeting a resistance, whether this is the resistance of discipline or the resistance of faith and belief. And this resistance causes these emotions to turn upon themselves and to create powerful vortices within the personality. And these vortices may ultimately break through any resistance that is built as a tremendous stream of water may break through a dam or force its way over the banks of the stream in which it normally flows. All of these situations show us why, in its wisdom, the universe has supplied us with a mind. The purpose of this mental life being to assist in the orientation of the individual and to gradually break down this intense reaction, this association, completely intimate, between the person and his feelings. Now, the origin and development of man's mental life, as this relates to the compound of his personality, is almost certainly traceable to the great need which man had to rationalize and understand the reasons why he must abide by certain rules and regulations in the administrating of his affairs. It follows that the mind leads us gradually to a less personal attitude toward everything. If the emotions are over-personal, the tendency of the mind is to become less than normally attached. The mind becomes a window out into a much larger concept of life. It also makes available to us, through the memories and records of our kind, the long panorama of human history. It gives us orientation in timing. It shows us relations between cause and effect and through its gradual development has imposed upon us broad philosophical plans or patterns or concepts. It has also given us a power to produce emotionally within ourselves a feeling which is not entirely natural to most of us, and that is patience. The individual who is under emotional stress will find that impatience is one of his common troubles. And he will also gradually learn that patience must arise from one of two factors were operating within him. Either the rise of faith as a powerful spiritual emotion, or else as the ri from the rise of knowledge, which is a great orienting factor in our living. Through the mind, we are able to share in common experiences, wherein, whereas in emotions, except upon a very high level of mystical apperception, we are bound to our own experiences. We gradually, through the mind, also become aware of what was called in the uh, 18th century the rights of man the rights of human beings to be themselves. Usually, this is discovered as a result of mental activity. The mind is of its own nature and core more or less passive. 
Without emotional stimulus, the mind is merely a kind of statistical machine by which certain facts are made known to us. Thus, mind by itself and without emotional support accomplishes very little. And what we conceive to be the hypothetical intellectual, the person who probably does not actually exist except in our own minds, this hypothetical intellectual is the completely mental person whose life is colorless because he is completely dominated by processes almost mathematical in their certainty and in their inevitable consequences. The mind then, without color, without motivation from emotion, is an extremely sterile instrument. But the mind, sustained by emotion, and in turn, integrating the emotional content through its own contribution becomes a wonderful and magnificent instrument of human progress. Wherever emotions are strong, the need for the mind is obvious. Wherever there is a tendency to intellectualize, the need of the emotions is evident. Thus, these are compatible and companionable parts of our energy consciousness. And without both of them, we would be unable to function within any pattern of normalcy. The mind coming forward into the picture begins to reveal to us uh, the need for patience and the need for a more or less impersonal attitude on some emotional problems. The person who becomes entirely impersonal may be accused of losing vitality and color, but certainly there are not too many in whom this excess is observable. The opposite is more commonly true. The person is too personal and too easily involved within the small patterns of his likes and dislikes. Now to go back for a moment to our utopian who was frustrated because he could see a better land and a better world than he was living in. Let us give to him now the support of the mind. Let him recognize the, from mental consideration and from bringing in the evidence which the mind can accumulate that we live in a growing world that what we call a utopian future, while it is to us the substance of all things desired, would itself be only a relative, a point in an infinite existence. That we are better, that we are growing, that we are producing a more rational, reasonable, and enlightened world. And that in time, with patience, and with those works which make things come true, what we call a utopian state is attainable. But it is not attainable because of a tremendous outburst of emotion. It is not to be achieved merely by a vast desire. This desire must be put to work. It must lead to conduct consistent with its own purposes. And the individual must be taught that the fact that things which he wants cannot be immediately his should not be the source of discouragement or rebellion, but should be invitation to industry, the power to make these things come true. The mind striking home at emotional excess will point out that nearly any reasonable thing that the emotions require can be granted if this desire leads to proper conduct and leads to the acceptance of such disciplines as are necessary to produce the needed proficiency and ability. 
Thus, if the person desires with all his heart and soul to be a musician and can envision inwardly the magnificent performance that he will sometime give, this is in itself a great stimulation. But if this music-loving person, this individual desirous of expressing himself in this way, does not receive with his impulse the attitude of achievement, he is not going to attain the end which he desires. For between his emotional conviction and his great impulse and the final performance which is to fulfill his sense of rightness and fitness must come those long years of study, those long hours in which he is a slave to a technique. There must also come the gradual gaining of control by the mind and the will over the poorly integrated physical body. And we are reminded, of course, of the words of Paderewski relating to this subject, where he says, if I fail to practice for one day, I know it. If I fail for two days, my friends know it. And if I miss three days practice, the world knows it. Therefore, to the great love of music must come slavery, servitude to the thing desired, a conscientious application of energy, patience, years of preparation, by means of which the individual becomes capable of those things which he inwardly desires to do and also creates an instrument capable of releasing his own emotion according to law and discipline and in a manner acceptable to those around him. The great musician is not merely a technician, and when he is, he is seldom, if ever, fully accepted. There are many magnificent and brilliant technicians whose playing falls short of greatness simply because of this lack of tremendous internal realization, this great emotional wealth that must flow through those trained fingers. We know, for example, that various conductors conducting the same piece of music can cause it to seem different and can give very definite interpretation to what appears to be a fixed and unchangeable score. Thus emotions do come through and do produce great and wonderful modifications in things which seem fixed and unchangeable. But without discipline, without integration, without the willingness to earn the things desired, emotion uh, becomes a confusing and difficult force to work with in the life of man. The great emotion of man is centered very strongly and definitely upon the love of beauty, upon the love of reality, upon an earnest and sincere desire to experience the consciousness of God. Yet this tremendous emotional integrity is more or less obscured today by the highly personal field of emotional interests and activities with which we have surrounded ourselves. And so from some theories of this nature, which we hope will set a groundwork, we want to descend into a more concrete consideration of the emotional life of the individual in his common experiences, in the world in which he lives, and in the problems with which he is daily faced. Perhaps one of the most common emotions that we have today is discontent. Now, discontent has been subject to a very large field of analysis. We are assured that discontent is what makes the wheel go round. That if the individual was contented, progress would stop in its tracks. That we are moved on 
by some strange necessity within ourselves, this irresistible and inevitable impulse to become more, uh, to transcend the attained and continue the endless quest of the unattained. Uh, this discontent, however, unless it is purposed, unless it is meaningful, is often merely a continuous irritation, contributing almost nothing to progress of any kind. Discontent is not progress unless it inspires improvement. The individual is not growing because he is unhappy. He is not growing because he is frustrated. He is not growing because he is in a situation which is unpleasant. He grows only when this situation or this condition or this state causes him to recognize his own ineptitudes and forces upon him the factual conclusion that he is not sufficient for his need at that particular moment or in that particular field of action. Any discontent, therefore, which does not inspire self-improvement is a wasted emotion. And yet to most persons, discontent is frustrated by a kind of emotional mental analysis which it becomes hopelessly involved in during the course of living. This reminds us also that the emotions, if they dominate the mind and become possessors and despots over the intellectual life of the individual, will reduce the mind to a kind of agreeing mechanism. The mind will become subservient to the emotions and will exist only to justify that which the feelings have already dictatorially postulated. Thus, if the mind is merely used to justify and excuse the emotions, we have lost its value. We have removed from it its independent function and have bound it by a tyranny to a justification of negative conduct. Now, a great many persons suffer from this predicament. The mind only functions to remind them of their own misfortunes. This is a squirrel cage which is really uh, very difficult and frequently lands or ends in a psychotic state. The mind must have rights and privileges of its own. <coughs> And it is just as dangerous to dominate your own mind as to attempt to dominate the thinking of some other mind. Wherever we attempt to impose domination upon the freedom of action of the parts of ourselves or of other persons, we are doomed uh, to a great tragedy in living. A great part of our emotional disaster is due to this impossibility of forcing other persons to do things we want them to. We have gradually come to the conviction within ourselves that emotional satisfaction is dependent upon the conduct of others. We feel that our worries are due to what other people do. Our fears are due to their conduct. Our anxieties are because of them or for them. Our hates are merely retaliations for their injuries. Our cupidities are efforts to protect ourselves against their uh, various intrusions into our possessions and means. And altogether, our general apprehension about life is due to the way everyone else acts. Now, when you have that all settled in your own consciousness, and you're quite sure of it, and you're satisfied that as a result of this 
uh, attitude, you are the victim of everything else and everyone else, then you are all ready to settle down into a nice, soft, gloomy neurosis. <laughs> From that time on, it does not make much difference what happens, because nothing will mean anything. You have taken the entire rationality out of life. And because you have closed yourself around the nursing of wounded feelings or outraged pride or something of that nature, you then turn every resource that you have upon yourself in a desperate effort to develop some autocompensatory or escape mechanism which will stop a little of the pain or the hurt. It is very much as though, then, you haunted the pharmaceutical houses for every conceivable kind of liniment and balm and ointment that might bring some soothing uh, to your seriously injured libido. Out of all of this, however, the process of introversion becomes increasingly strong by habit. And the longer we maintain habits of negative emotion, the stronger they become, until finally we are in a state of total disorientation and have no faculties left with which to fight our own condition. The answer to this, of course, lies... Uh, usually for most persons, in the bridge of mind by which the individual is connected with some sources or circumstances outside of himself. We know that in evolutionary processes, primitive man thought only of himself. And as we study the great works of those illumined leaders who are far beyond us in their normal unfoldment of internal power, we realize that man of the future, spiritualized man, will think less and less about himself until the common good becomes his one and primary concern. Thus, the individual who becomes completely wrapped up in himself is a man of the past. He is archaic. He belongs to a time when people use stone axes and uh, lived in holes in the sides of hills. He is a late surviving remnant of the Cro-Magnon. Now that probably would be one more burden for his heavily depressed nature to bear. All he has to do is to have someone tell him he's wrong and his tragedy is complete. <laughs> Yet it is undoubtedly true that self-centeredness is one of the most prim primitive and therefore probably most universal of all emotions. And the, in the individual for thousands of years has been struggling to outgrow egocentricity or the complete absorption of himself in himself. If he finds this situation creeping upon him and lives in the modern world with modern advantages of education and knowledge and contact, he probably does dimly realize that he is wrong. But how to escape this wrongness uh, becomes for him the ever-pressing problem in reality. Naturally and obviously, the best time to break a habit is when it's young. The longer you wait, the harder the time will be. But there is no way of breaking any habit without some exertion of the will. The only other answer is to leave it to the universe. And of course, in time, the infinite will can break and does break all habits. But the individual who is waiting for the universe to set him right is not quite comfortable in the interval. 
because he is usually somewhere between the upper and the lower grindstone and is feeling the weight heavily upon himself. If, however, we are not satisfied to linger in a state of desuetude indefinitely, then we must do something ourselves. And to do something, we must recognize the capacity to do it and realize that when we pay others to do these things for us, we are merely paying them to stimulate our self-confidence. And if we do not have that self-confidence, they also will fail to help us. Having not sufficient self-confidence, and having accepted a blind despair for a blind exhilaration, we cannot realize that we are not as weak as we think we are, even as we are not as strong as we think we are. The individual, for example, who held the utopian idea with all his heart and soul and was quite convinced that he would live to see the paradise on earth, somewhere along the line, comes to his bitter disillusionment. He realizes that for perhaps half a century he has been daydreaming, that he has been living in a kind of private paradise of his own that was little better than a fool's paradise. The natural reaction to this is a vicious swing of the pendulum to the opposite direction. There is nothing good the bottom is out of the universe. Everyone is wrong. Everything is hopeless. And he will say, as so often we hear it, that he has wasted a lifetime, that he has no longer the years to reorganize his thinking, and there is nothing left for him to do but slowly and sadly tumble into an open grave at the earliest moment of convenience. <laughs> He is crushed and without further resolution to go on. Now, it doesn't have to be a great big utopian dream about the infinite wisdom of mankind that produces this. He can be crushed by almost anything. The weight of a pin falling on him at a critical moment can also crush him. And many individuals have been completely crushed with trivialities. Actually, out of counseling and experience, we observe that persons are most likely to be crushed by trivialities. Some way we get an extra strength for a real emergency, and the body supports us by giving us a good strong shot of adrenaline, and we go on and face it. The straw that breaks the camel's back is often something of comparatively little importance. But it releases this false, piled-up house of cards that we have, and the whole thing tumbles about us. Of course, all things are not trivial, and there are many individuals who have lost faith, lost hope, because some one person in whom they had invested all of these emotions proved unworthy or inadequate. And the entire faith in humanity falls with the faith in a single person. The will to go on is only vital while the individual is doing the things that he wants to do. Let's pause on this point for just a second because it's an interesting one. Building a very small world of emotional satisfactions around himself. The individual may have his entire universe so restricted that it does not extend beyond four walls. Within these four walls, he has a way of life that does no good to anyone, that is meaningless in substance, is no contribution to his own progress or anything else. It is a small, trivial, world made over-important 
by investing it with enormous emotional overtones. Something comes along and breaks this pattern. The individual is lost. Everything that is important is gone. In sober fact, he never had anything important in the first place. What he calls important is merely the perpetuation of a, of a circle of trivia. This importance never meant either real service to others or real growth for himself. It was simply a small, a little circle of likes and dislikes. And the comforting satisfaction of changing the wallpaper every six months. This was life. This was the universe. And something breaks this up. The person feels hopelessly impoverished. Actually, the sooner it was broken up, the richer he would be. Because what he was doing was going nowhere. And he was gradually unfolding into a complete nobody. But it was comfortable. It was pleasing. It was just loaded with smug contentment. It was just, as one said, too too divine. <laughs> to be jolted out of such a rut as this is a tragedy when it happens, but a blessing when it is understood. So the problem rises, how to transform a tragedy into a blessing through understanding. Anyone with this gift, however, is not neurotic, so that it's it's something that is not easily communicated from the individual who is experiencing all this misfortune upon his own flesh and someone who walks by and tells him that he's foolish. There is more to this problem than that. But there is also the recognition that where this smallness has defeated largeness, and it does this constantly and forever in human relations. The mind, as well as the emotions, need, uh, needs uh, assistance, needs direction, needs the broadening and enlarging of perspective. Nature, by taking away the lesser, has invited man to the greater. But very few find the invitation particularly pleasing. We want to be left like the old dragon of the Rhinegold to sleep as we will. Nature will not permit sleep. These small sonolent worlds in which we live, these little fancies which lock us and make us feel that we have or we have not, are a kind of sleeping they have no essential meaning. And nature will not permit any creature to abide indefinitely in them. The purpose of nature is to keep man awake, to cause him to grow, and to help him to unfold the power for real security which lies within him. So these things which we call disasters are really actually blessings in disguise because they force us to face facts. Emotions are almost unable alone to face facts, because fact and emotion are incompatible. Fact is apparently cold, emotion is heated. Facts are so drear and dismal to the average person, and fancies are so much more interesting. We live in a world in which we fancify nearly everything with which we contact, which we are in contact. We fancify food and clothing and housing. We create overtones and daydreams about every interest and association and attitude that we have. And because we are not awake, 
we are always in danger of being awakened. And just as a person is awakened by a loud and sudden noise or by some change in the situation around him while he sleeps, he is wakened by some emotional circumstance, some jolt that breaks this wonderful chain of daydreaming which has become to him the proper way of life. Now in thinking of this kind also, in this kind of emotionalizing, there are only two states of being. This daydreaming, which is a kind of internal reality, and facts, which are cold and bitter and nasty and unpleasant, not being adjusted to facts, we react to them much as the small child reacts when it comes to the dawn of maturity. Suddenly this child is no longer a plaything, catered to, loved and protected. Suddenly it is expected to live its own life, make a living, create a home and bear a responsibility. There are lots of children who have a terrible time making this transition. But they are supported, of course, psychologically by the fact that all others of their kind must do the same. Thus, by habit, by example, by tradition and authority, they gain a certain resolution to go on. But this shift from emotional infancy to maturity is a very private thing. It happens inside of us. We are not observing it happening around us. We are alone, apparently, in this transition because while everyone else is passing through it also, we cannot know this. We cannot see it. And our objective senses do not give us the support of the common experience. So suddenly we find ourselves jolted into reality. And, of course, our natural instinct is to object. Reality is not as beautiful, as pleasant, and as soft as this unreality that we have uh, been supporting by tremendous emotional expenditures within ourselves. But what is the truth of this? Is this daydream good, and are the facts bad? Actually, the reverse is more nearly the truth. This daydreaming, unless it is in some way bound to facts, will lead almost inevitably to the most terrible disasters that life must face. It is good and proper that the individual should dream within himself. But it is also good and proper that all healthy dreaming should immediately stimulate action on a factual level and come into expression through creative contribution to culture. Thus, the dreams and ideals we have should make us work harder here and now and should gradually assist us to cope with facts more completely. To divorce the daydream from the fact and to build a barrier between the two and to consider the part within the barrier as good and the part outside as bad is a false division due to the simple concept that we all have, namely that what we do not like is bad. Whereas what we do not like is often the greater good for us. And without its influence, we would never develop any resourcefulness in our own nature. So the problem of what kind of a factual world we live in is also important. Actually, what we call the world of fact is a vast arena of experience in which innumerable human beings on various levels of mental, emotional, and physical activity are struggling together in their own searching for realities. This is a very confusing world, and a world which can easily embitter those who have no basic understanding in themselves. But this world does not embitter those who do have understanding. 
It is not a cold, cruel world. It is a world of imperfect things, doing according to their own conceits and miscomprehensions, but all striving and growing together toward integration. It is very probable that the persons that we meet will not be integrated, that they will not have the virtues which we have internally bestowed upon them. But these people potentially possess the roots of such virtues and in due time will manifest them. Realizing, therefore, that impact with life will be impact with insecurity, that the world is made up of vast numbers of persons who are not secure themselves and are therefore subject to all of the inconsistencies and inconstancies which we possess. We suddenly have the unpleasant experience of finding ourselves living in a world peopled with creatures like ourselves and therefore difficult to get along with. We have long held the attitude that our peculiarities are unique and that the fact that we have an ill temper makes that temper virtuous. But the same temper in another does not seem nearly so virtuous to us. And gradually we realize that there are a great many different kinds of dispositions, most of them objectionable, that we have an excellent example of one of them and that other people have excellent examples of other types, classes, and kinds. We will say to ourselves, I know that perhaps I'm not always just as kind as I should be, but I mean well, so do they. And this general condition of well-meaning has produced about 8,000 wars in the last 4,000 years. We just mean so well we can hardly stand it. <laughs> and when other people mean well, it is almost more than we can endure. And when we mean well, chaos breaks loose. All these things must be taken with perspective. And in order to have any kind of perspective, we must have a point of view. And that point of view must be an integration somewhere within our own natures. We must have inside a little hilltop somewhere, which we can climb to the top of and look around and see the cities of the plains spread out before us. We must be able to get away from the little street and the little house and the little store on the corner. We must also be able to get away from the continuous impact of immediate and intimate associations and realize that these associations like those of the larger world are symbolical and that every person whom we meet is a symbol of a person inside of ourselves and that there is no vice in others that is not potentially present in us. But the hopeful thing is that there is no virtue ever practiced by man that we cannot also practice. Somewhere in the middle distances lie the facts as they are today. This is not a world that is essentially perfect, and it is not going to be for a time at least. But it is not a world that is essentially bad. It is growing. We look at a growing child, and we are not disappointed because it is not mature. We know that it will be in due time. When we look at a growing child, we also look at a little bundle of unbalanced forces. We recognize the struggle through the difficult years of adolescence. We realize that emotions and thoughts are fighting and struggling on the battlefield of this child's consciousness. We are patient. We hope for the best, and usually we are not too seriously disappointed. But the world is also an emotional child with its own psychic battlefields, which very often ultimately become physical battlefields. Here we have selfishness and ambition struggling in man 
and manifesting through the institutions that he builds. Our selfishness is sacred. The selfishness of others is profane. But it will always be that way. That is how they look at it also. If we have some integration, some point of, of validity within our own natures, we do not need to depend upon the intoxication of emotional excess to keep ourselves alive and going. We are perfectly capable of using our emotions constructively, using them to appreciate good, using them to understand the values, using them to feel the kinships with the greater truths of life and existence. But we must also bring into this the modifying, patience-begetting faculty of reason. If we are reasonable in our attitudes, we will not be neurotic. If we are reasonable in our demands, we will not generally be greatly disappointed. Again, there comes the problem of what is reasonable. One man told me once that his idea of reasonable was that there was no reason why he shouldn't have what he wanted. <laughs> We also even have religious groups that teach that anything we want, God wants us to have. But against this teaching is the fact that nearly everything we want, God has not given us. So that uh, there we have to face the situation that perhaps the things that we want must be earned. And that the rewards of life, like the securities of physical existence, depend upon the individual being a wise and provident Householder, uh, keeping laws, using them, and building upon them for common good. So, in the problem of, the, of these conflicts between our mental and emotional natures, it is a very good plan for us to form a partnership there and to see that mind and emotion are united in a kind of wedlock of purpose from which a fruitfulness will come. For the wisest and noblest reflections of men have been the product of the union of thought and emotion, which forming together a whole and each contributing its own part will result in a magnificent strength within the person with which to face all of the needs and problems of his life. Yet in such a union there is not only strength but also the fear of tyranny. And it must be upon a very democratic basis that these parts of our own psychic life find their compatible uh, mutual relationship. If then we are inclined to be a little too neurotic, if we are inclined to be depressed or eccentric in our moods, finding one day great joy and the next great misery, we realize the immaturity within ourselves and come to understand that this emotional energy that we have should not be used fighting shadows and that it will fight shadows until light is thrown upon the matter and the proper proportions of the problems are revealed to us. Man has two spheres of responsibility, personal and collective. Man's effect upon the collective is always a matter of concern to him. He feels competitively impotent in his effort to change the larger patterns of life around him. He observes the tremendous area which his small energy must attack. And he almost certainly knows that he cannot win. Yet he must also realize that he has social duty. That he has responsibility to collective. And that if he is a reasonable person, this responsibility begins with himself. As we have often said, we cannot change the world immediately, but we can change ourselves. And by changing ourselves, we can often make a powerful contribution to the whole world. Sometimes this contribution is not obvious or immediate. 
Sometimes this contribution will descend through our children and their children, but bring with it a better integration, which will gradually expand over the great areas of time and place. There are many, many unknown and unhonored persons whose names have been forgotten, who have yet contributed to the great flow of culture and civilization and life. A few names we know, but growth also came from the many who are unnamed representing great solid levels of integrities which help to sustain, support, protect, and preserve. And these levels must be maintained today. And such levels are composed of groups of individuals individually integrated. It is therefore a very important social duty to put oneself in order. No one grows alone. No one suffers alone and no one destroys alone. And the things which we do affect others, and this in turn affects the entire future of life. It is therefore good and proper for us to recognize the area of our emotional responsibility through the cultivation of a mental recognition of values. The emotion trained, disciplined, and improved by mind can gradually gain tranquility or proper purpose. Emotions do not reform, essentially, because the emotional energy is not a kind of energy that is subject to reform. What we would term emotional improvement lies merely in the channeling of emotional energy. The energy is always the same. It is the use of it through the structures that we build and plan that determines what we call good and bad emotion. The emotions themselves are neither good nor bad. The channels through which they move either perfect them or pollute them according to the nature of the channel itself. Emotion moving through the life of a selfish person is destructive. Emotion moving through the life of an enlightened person appears itself enlightened. Because these energies are seeking always normal expression. And when they are normal, they are good. All emotional stress, therefore, is abnormal. All negative, destructive emotions are abnormal. <coughs> they are not due to the energy itself being polluted. They are due to the failure of the individual to use it. Thus the failure is in himself and not in society, nor in some strange heavenly region from which these energies seem to flow. The use and abuse of emotional energy belongs to and is in the keeping of the person himself. When he realizes this and begins to do something about it, he finds that he cannot dream true, that he can envision within himself the next steps of his own growth, that he can rationalize and emotionally intensify his own sincere and honorable desire to grow. And when emotion takes the form of the desire to improve and to serve, that emotion begins to normalize itself and begins to uh, help and strengthen the inner life of the person who has it. The effort to grow, the effort to use emotion constructively, almost inevitably brings in the mental factor. Because the mind provides us with instruments of means. It shows us what needs to be done. It even gives us clues as to how it can be done. And most persons who are doing nothing know how to do many things, but they are blocked by this peculiar emotional tension which takes the attitude, either what I want or nothing, and locks the entire situation. The person under emotional stress today is not uneducated, nor is he unable. He is a person who has become hopelessly captured in a dream which he cannot seemingly awake from. 
and against which he offers every possible resistance when others try to awaken him. Actually, he is living in a smaller world and a lesser one and refusing to accept a better life for himself. If he can be convinced of this, he can gradually be convinced of the importance of gradually sublimating these intensities and unfolding a code of principles within his nature which is strong enough to dominate and direct action. All these things come to a degree from mental energy, from mental excitation and adaptation. Thus the individual becomes aware of a great philosophy of life or a great philosophy of religion. He gradually comes to know from the acceptance of a philosophic concept the reason for the things he does and why he should do them differently. He will continue to do them the way he is doing them now, however if only reason is appealed to, because reason will sit by and say, yes, yes, and do nothing. Or reason will exhaust itself on a piece of paper, explaining how it should be done, and do nothing. Or reason will enter into great debate to justify and prove its own point, will convince nobody, and remain convinced itself. Thus reason simply as an instrument of solution, says this is this, and that is that, and nobody cares. Because we are not sufficiently moved, even by the factual concept of truth itself. What we have to have is this emotional color behind it. And this emotional color comes only when to the natural definition of truth, comes the stimulation of the love of truth, the love of beauty, the love of wisdom, the sincere desire to serve others by making ourselves better instruments of living. So emotion takes over the rational concepts, even as it may take over the irrational concepts. By degrees, emotion vitalizes our belief in law, and gives us strength to bear a great number of adversities because we are convinced of the reality of principles. Gradually, emotion causes us also to love things which are not immediately and evidently lovable. For instance, the laws of the universe, which do not want us to do, apparently, just what we would like to do. We learn to respect them. We learn to admire them, and when we recognize the universality of their justice, suddenly we discover that we love them, that we are glad they are the way they are. And this gladness is an emotional acceptance. It is satisfaction. It is faith. It is the recognition that we live in a kind of security made possible only by universal justice. Thus, as the small man is forever afraid of justice, so the great man is grateful that it exists. And as in our daily living, we do not like laws, but call upon them when we are in trouble, so it's a, there is a great emotional strength in realizing a universe uh, which can be depended on to keep faith, to keep truth, and to reward effort. This gradually becomes more interesting to us and more stimulating, more vitalizing than this belief in a universe which will forever do just what we want it to. As we should never play chess with a player who is poorer than ourselves if we want to play a good game, so we should never live in a universe that isn't wiser than we are, that isn't stronger, which does not constantly challenge us to improve our own way of life in order to come into security, peace of mind, and happiness. Thus emotional pressures of one kind or another can either completely overwhelm us or they can remind us forcibly that there is a weakness in our own natures or we would be able to meet these pressures with some dignity, integration, and good sense and good-heartedness. If we find we cannot do these things, if we live in perpetual irritation, 
we are always miserable and unhappy when things do not go our way, then we are just plain adolescents. We have not found maturity. We may hide behind this adolescence by trying to escape into an internal introversion. It is of no good to us. Ultimately, we shall be forced out of it, and the longer we are in it, the greater the tragedy of awakening will be. Or we may gradually and quietly and systematically wake ourselves up. We can do it by gradually accepting more and more emotional maturity in our own lives. We can be glad when we see other people happy, instead of it reminding us that we are not happy. We can be glad to see other people succeed, instead of instinctively feeling the success should have been ours. Little by little, we can also rejoice in the freedom that we give, rather than the bondage which we impose. And as we change these emotions, and basically grow up, using the mind to guide us along lines of proper mental thinking, we suddenly discover that the reality is better than the illusion. We discover, for example, that these people whom we have released come back to us of their own accord, glad and happy to share life with us, while those that we have held so desperately are forever seeking to escape and if they do escape, they never do come back. So for a little, momentary, passing, dictatorial domination over somebody, we lose the wonderful experience of real friendship, real understanding, and real comradeship. Actually, the rewards of release are much greater and more beautiful and more satisfactory than the rewards which come to those who seek to bind. And it is the same with every part of our emotional concept. The desperate effort to be happy is always crowned with misery because we cannot become happy merely by catering to ourselves. If the things which make us happy are not big, if they are not real, if they are not in harmony with nature's way. They can never make us happy. And any small pleasure that we find will ultimately be overwhelmed in a great disaster. But when we find our happiness through keeping the rules, through unfolding and developing and adjusting our lives, we find that our happiness grows, increases, and that we have many years of secure and solid personality adjustment to look forward to. We sleep better, eat better, have more friends, are more successful in our undertakings, advance in our occupations, and have a larger and more noble attitude toward the common world we are part of. We are not overwhelmed by the newspaper. We are not discouraged by the radio. We are not completely undone by the motion picture. We find that these things are understandable and we are not passing constantly through one disillusionment and shock after another. So the education of the emotions represents really their fulfillment. We are not less emotional. We are simply normally emotional with beauty and fineness and kindness and truth strong on our emotional horizon. We have also formed a friendship with the mind, because if the things we are doing is true, are true, the mind and the emotions can agree on them. If they are not true, the mind is forever telling us so, and the emotions are forever biting back. All this inconsistency can be quietly regenerated by the person who really wants to have peace of soul, who desires real security and does not find complete satisfaction in a fool's paradise. So we say that these two lines of activity, mental and emotional, are compatible. Their common ground is the truth or the fact of the matter. And the fact of the matter is always the most beautiful, the most real, the most lovable, that most subject of to admiration, 
For there is nothing in the world that should command our deepest and noblest emotions more than the fact of the matter. For we will never find anything more beautiful, more helpful, more worthy of a magnificent emotional expression. But while we have not sought the fact, we are under the perpetual disturbance and pressure of thoughts and emotions. We must work with them industriously, quietly, without pressure, seeking to give them their birthrights, the one the right to feel true, the other the right to think true. And when we do this, they get along together magnificently. And we get along with ourselves much more harmoniously. It is the quotient of error that always causes conflict. And where the individual is not emotionally poised, there's something wrong with him and not with the world. If he will begin to think in those terms constructively, and with the optimistic realization he can correct what is wrong. He will have a richer life, his friends will be happier, his family will be more devoted, and he will have beautiful, quiet experiences of dreaming true, dreams that really belong to the great vision of a growing world. Time's up.